so the video did well, huh? If you enjoy this video, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell icon to stay up to date on all future uploads. During the last What's the Plot video, we covered the story of Lust for Darkness and Lust from Beyond, and before we go any further, I want to make it clear that I think the premise of these games can be done well. I find the concept interesting on paper. I just don't think that they succeeded because the desire to shock conservative sensibilities superseded everything else. Do we understand each other? Yes? All right? Good. So let's get into it. To begin with, if you're trying to shock people, you could have continued playing as Amanda from the beginning and set the game during that year of captivity, bearing witness to all the messed up activities of the cult. It would have been horrific, but seeing as that was the point, it's odd to swerve it. From there, we could have had a game where Amanda burns the cult down from within, kills her tormentor and saves her child, going on to hunt down other adherents of Lustga. Now, I recognize there's a genuine horror in being the one trying to save your loved ones from a terrible situation. The problem arises when there's no legwork done to make the player care about the characters at risk, but if you play as the character in danger, it's much easier to feel invested, which is something they seemed to realize in the second game. The male protagonist, motivated by a wife who is in danger or needs to be avenged, is very, very, very well-trodden ground, and I don't think it's impossible to make that compelling. That is a completely fine motivation for the player character to have, but as will be a recurring theme throughout this video, nothing is really done with regards to how the protagonist feels about any of the <laughs> elements, nor do we get any insight into how Amanda felt before any of this happened. One can infer that she and Jonathan had a typical relationship between a husband and wife, but after the events of the first game, if you check through Amanda's belongings again, she now has a toy, indicating a shift in her <laughs> appetite which is confirmed when she opens a portal and says Willard was right, let's etc etc. This is something that the second game fails to follow up on as well, where there's no real exploration of how anyone feels about or approaches sexuality. As an example, you can engage in some homosexual encounters as Victor, but this is never really commented on, whether he's bisexual or pan, he just doesn't care, or if the cult itself doesn't care and pleasure is just pleasure no matter who is partaking in it. It would seem that way, but most of the encounters we see are heterosexual with a sprinkling of two women together, because straight men love to see that and pretend that they would be welcomed as a third party. This leaves the subject matter feeling incidental, as if it's just a coat of paint over the story. And that's a shame, because you could do a lot with this kind of subject matter. People have a lot of hang-ups about and a lot of misconceptions, a lot of harmful notions and approaches that are deeply unhealthy. And the funny thing is, there is a grain of something deeper in the background lore, where these beings called the Demiurges formed from fundamental forces of reality, and they created avatars of their will on different worlds to manage those forces. In Lustga, this was derailed by the three avatars of that world in their quest for eternal pleasure, because upon achieving that quest, their entire world was rendered stagnant. Nothing could grow, nothing could advance, nothing could change, nothing could transform. This was anathema to their creators because they were all about advancement, transformation, the cycling of energy and matter and information. But again, that's just in the background. It doesn't go any further than that where the main story is concerned. All you do is get manipulated into almost releasing the main god so that he can do the same thing to Earth. Or releasing him if you make the choice to accept Amanda's offer and then everything is terrible. It's frustrating because while I can respect the desire to buck conservative sensibilities and be free to create your art regardless of puritanical ideals, that does not mean you are or should be immune to criticism. You have created something and put it out there into the world people are going to respond. It's me, I'm people. Returning to the previous point of blending horror and eroticism, there are readily available examples of such from books and film. 
two such would be Silence of the Lambs and, more fittingly for this game series, Hellraiser. In Silence of the Lambs, there's a very overbearing feeling of the main female character being picked apart by almost every other male character in the film. Disrespected, hit on, underestimated, etc. Except by Hannibal, who in his own twisted way develops a respect, admiration, and to whatever degree he is capable, love for her. There's a strange intellectual eroticism, a charged energy between them as they interact. There's something deeply compelling about their relationship as it develops and evolves. But it's only so compelling because of the excellent writing and incredible performances from Anthony Hopkins and Jodie Foster. If neither had been so high quality, it just wouldn't have worked as well. For a more explicit interplay of sexuality, violence, and horror, Hellraiser is a much better example of what this game series was after. Chasing the extremes of physical pleasure and pain, the summoning of beings and powers far beyond mortal ken, and so much more artfully than this. It perfectly explored how destructive the chasing of hedonism can be to those around you and to yourself, hurting and killing to preserve the thing that brings you ecstasy. But for these games, there's little to no exploration, no experimenting with gender, sexuality, the transformation of bodies into something you find more comfortable and therefore confident in. It's just deeply disappointing and shallow set dressing. At the end of the first game, the story almost started to address something that it never really gets close to again until near the end of the second game, where once Amanda is rescued from the cult, she expresses that during the year she was abused and used by Willard, she grew to want it, she enjoyed it, and that everything that happened to her in the cult became everything she ever wanted. It became the only thing she wanted because she didn't have to think about what was actually happening to her. She just sank into the physical sensations it brought her. Obviously, this is due to being there for a year and being brainwashed and corrupted by the cult and the trauma of it all. She manages to go back to a mostly normal life for two years after being rescued, but regresses at the very end and gives into the eldritch vibes. Now, for a Lovecraftian horror piece, I understand why this happened. There were a few commenters who assumed that I didn't understand cosmic horror. I know that it is a common thing in cosmic horror for people to go mad from the revelation or succumb to the things they've witnessed. I get that. I enjoy this kind of horror. Dead Space is one of my favourite examples of it because it blends the mysteries of space like the Fermi Paradox with an absolutely terrifying answer in the markers. For those who don't know, the Fermi Paradox refers to a contradiction between the seemingly high likelihood for the emergence of extraterrestrial intelligence and the lack of evidence for its existence. If you want a fun and sometimes very unsettling rabbit hole to explore, I highly recommend looking into it. Back to the topic at hand, I don't have issue with characters succumbing to the madness. My problem is that trauma surrounding SA, the complicated feelings survivors may have about their experiences, and the judgments associated with it, these are very messy, delicate, sensitive things to splice with the eldritch madness took over. It bulldozes those complex issues into something outside of the character's control, essentially subjecting them to another assault that they can't escape nor heal from. I personally don't find value in that. I think it's a waste of potential storytelling and a gross mishandling of those issues. I could have forgiven a lot more if the sequel had become a revenge-type deal. I typically don't enjoy those kinds of films, but if they can do it without showing the instigating trauma on screen, I find it much easier to watch. But that's just me. I know there are people who have been through that that find catharsis in those films, and I'm glad that they can. There needs to be media where that kind of affirmation and release can be found. Amanda isn't the only one who needs to be mentioned here, however. Throughout the second game, Victor is subjected to multiple assaults. Austerlitz performs on him while he's helpless on the cross, a Scarlet Lodge cultist assaults him in the theatre, Rhea tortures him for an unspecified time, and he's forced to receive again later on pain of death. The lack of reaction to or discussion of how Victor feels about these experiences is a significant sticking point for me. How the game deploys is also 
just kind of terrible, especially when it comes to Amanda's arc from the first game to the second. But however awful Amanda's experiences were, the game at least acknowledges that they happened and that they weren't positive experiences. Victor doesn't react to his experiences, and they're never mentioned as far as I could tell, which gives the impression that it just didn't matter, or he was okay with it because he got off even though he clearly wasn't okay with it at the time. I cannot stress enough that it doesn't matter if the act brought Victor to completion. That is a purely mechanical function. If it was coerced, or pressured, or forced on him in any way, that is wrong. If someone puts you in a situation where you feel like you have to do something even though you don't want to, that is wrong. And if someone tells you that you're a man so you can't be or to man up if you complain about something that was done to you, that person is wrong and they do not have your best interest at heart. You were hurt and you deserve to be taken seriously. I can see, thanks to YouTube's analytics, that most of you watching right now are men. So on the not insignificant chance any of this struck a chord with you, I've linked some resources down below should they be needed. Now, despite a modified version of the transgender symbol being used throughout the games, there was never any real exploration or talk about gender and how that plays into sexuality. There were hints of dominant femininity in places, but that was never really discussed either. In both games, you can find three statues lined up together depicting human bodies in varied states of being, a trans woman, a trans man, and something in between. Yet, nowhere is this ever a point of discussion. The most difference we get in bodies are the conjoined twins Donald and Dominic, and they're really just there to be an oddity, like we're at an old-timey freak show. So I hesitate to imagine what the devs would have done with the theme of trans bodies. The changed enemies you flee from in the second game are more feminine looking than not, but clearly possess an enlarged which is as close as we get to any real depiction of bodies outside the expected binary. This is weird to me because the Land of Ecstasy is a completely alien realm separate from our own, so you'd expect the creatures here to have absolutely wild anatomy. Tails that end in double-headed tongues for fingers, corkscrew tentacles they wrap around their hips like a DIY scroll, prehensile fucking knots. Just get creative, goddammit. Instead it feels pedestrian, ironically safe in its bland, heterosexual idea of transgressive media. Which neatly folds into the use of BDSM fetish content to kind of demonize the Scarlet Lodge as somehow more fucked up than the Cult of Ecstasy. It seems counterintuitive for a setting that's all about chasing the extremes of ecstasy to position the group that is visually representative of the kinky community as enemies, worse than the cult or otherwise at odds with the protagonist, because by the end of the game, they aren't really worse or more evil. Amanda doesn't care about the world by releasing the Lustful God, so what was the point? The game just constantly swerves interesting conversations in favor of a bog-standard eldritch corruption story with shocking visuals slapped on top to scare the church elders. I can respect the intent to buck conservative stifling. I am in no way saying that these games shouldn't exist, and my criticism should not be taken as that. What I am saying is that I do not personally think that the narrative content of these games is well-crafted, and I think any writing decisions undertaken were sacrificed at the altar of rebelling against conservative sensibilities in Poland, where the studio is based. They wanted to shock people, and on that front they succeeded at what they set out to do. It's just a shame that in doing so they tripped over half a dozen other things that, in my opinion, are far more substantive. So what would I have done with this subject matter? Before we get into it, if this doesn't vibe with you, that is completely fine. If you find value in the games as is, that is completely fine. This is simply what I would have done with the subject matter instead. We can keep the first game almost completely the same. Amanda is taken by the cult, tormented for a year by Willard, and is rescued by her husband Jonathan after she manages to get a message to him. 
some details that I change would be the scenes where we see cultists engaging in their spicy rituals. It's also painfully limited to men and women engaging in very typical acts with each other. Instead, I'd sprinkle in some pairs of men, pairs of women, and mixing and matching, such as in one corner where there'd be a man taking a woman from behind, while a woman with a s is also taking him from behind. Do you see where I'm coming from here? The commenters who thought that I was just being a prude last time are rolling in their graves right now. I write egregiously horny fanfic in my free time, you absolute walnuts. I simply take offense to this shit being tasteless and boring. The most important change narratively is that after Jonathan and Amanda leave the mansion, a burning ruin, two years have passed where they try to live a normal life again, Amanda simply does not regress and become a cult leader. What does happen is that Amanda sits Jonathan down and tells him that she can't keep pretending everything is normal. She can't pretend that experience didn't happen and that she doesn't know about the horrors of Lustga, and she can't live in peace when she knows more people like Willard are out there. She's tried so hard to move on from it, but it's like a red hot coal buried in her belly, burning and smoldering until she feels like she's choking up thick black smoke. She can't do it anymore. She needs to hunt them down and burn this cult to the ground just like she did the Yelverton mansion. And she needs Jonathan to help her do it because she's scared she'll lose her way. It ends with Jonathan agreeing to help her, and this would be our lead-in to the sequel, where they've been hunting cult members, learning more about the Land of Ecstasy in order to sabotage it, and directly dealing with Amanda's trauma. How? Through Jonathan. There would be a number of cutscenes where Amanda asks Jonathan to play out what happened to her. Going through the motions of every terrible thing Amanda explicitly asks Jonathan to do, knowing that if she uses her safe word, he will stop knowing that Jonathan is only doing what she asked for, when she asked for it, how she asked for it, and that the situation is completely under her control. There would be several conversations between them where they discuss tastes and preferences in an honest, matter-of-fact way, acknowledging that Amanda's have shifted significantly after her experiences, and acknowledging that without judgement or commentary from Jonathan, as he does his best to simply make space for Amanda to navigate how she feels about it. Amanda would express conflict like she did towards the end of the first game, how it started to feel good and she would just sink into the pleasure to escape, but she knows that was equal parts her just trying to survive it and the corruptive influences of Lustgar trying to erode her will so she would give in and act as a vessel for its power. Am I suggesting that the corruption of Luska could serve as a metaphor for that horrible voice in your head that tells you you deserved it actually? That internalized victim blaming that puts the onus on you to prove why what happened to you was unjustifiable and wrong? Yeah, I am. Naturally, there'd be a pivotal moment where Amanda uses her safe word and Jonathan immediately stops, whereupon she breaks down and he's there to make sure she feels safe, cared for, and protected, soothing away her apologies and self-flagellation with the gentlest of reassurances. If you're going to blend violence and horror, you should be willing to get fucking real with it, because people can and do use to work through some really painful experiences that they dearly wish they could have been in control of, but just weren't. There are people who hire a dominatrix to blend sex and racism because they needed to work through some internalized pain. Does that mean everyone who engages in kink is just doing it as an alternative form of therapy? Absolutely not. But there is a genuine release for those who do. And if you're going to make a game with this kind of subject matter, why would you avoid delving into these kinds of conversations? You're here to be transgressive, aren't you? You wanted to push boundaries, yet all you could really come up with was bland, in-your-face debauchery with no greater depth than a puddle? How disappointingly flaccid. After many trials, struggles, and close calls with temptation, the sequel would eventually culminate with Amanda and Jonathan being blessed by the Demiurges and accelerating the decay of Lustgar to the cancerous Garne, which eventually silences the lustful god and frees Amanda from his call. 
we draw a distinction between the cult forcing a bastardized idea of BDSM on their victims and the open discussion between Amanda and Jonathan when they're together because it wouldn't just be Amanda's therapy play, she'd be in control at times indulging in Jonathan's preferences and his scenes would involve degradation, impact, and general punishment, as it would become clear that Jonathan feels he deserves the pain for failing to keep Amanda safe. What this means is that we'd still get all the sexual imagery, the debauchery, the violence, and the hedonism, but we would also get a narrative throughline about healing, resisting the violence done to you, and finding the means to help others escape it too. With that, we are done with our coverage for Lust for Darkness and Lust from Beyond. There's another game coming out, I will not be looking at it. If you enjoyed this, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and hit that bell icon to stay up to date on all future uploads. I also stream on Twitch every Wednesday and Saturday at 8pm GMT. In the arms of the angels! Fly away from here! Rip right through his shields. We're at a chance. <laughs> Thank you for watching, and special shout out to my patrons who are all very handsome people. If you'd also like to be called a very handsome people, check out the link in the description where you can support me from just one pound a month. Don't forget to drink your water, take your medication, and treat yourselves kindly and I will see you all next time.